Welcome to the No Code Podcast. My name is Jason Miller, and I'm joined today by the author of the new book, Low Code, No Code, Phil Simon. Phil, welcome. Jason, thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you joining us today, and I think it's it's timely that we're talking. Obviously, we've recently launched the No Code Playbook, but with your now 13th authored book, Low Code, No Code, you talk a lot about the power of Low Code, No Code and citizen development. And I think it's I think it's interesting because the world we feel and I think you feel is going in this direction. So can you talk to us a little bit about what you think of the world of citizen development and how it's growing in the business world? It's nothing short of a revolution, Jason. It's one of the reasons I, like you, worked really quickly and hard to get the book out so soon. As I did the research for the book, I realized that even though citizen development as a term only made inroads, I think it was 2014 or 15, I cite the Forrester report in the book. It's actually been around as a long time, whether you've been a business technologist or something else. And I can remember back in the day using Microsoft Access to create really single person applications that really didn't scale across an organization or other than say Microsoft access talking to Outlook or Excel, it's basically Microsoft talking to Microsoft. Well, fast forward 25 years and now these tools are to use a 50 cent word interoperable or extensible. So I can absolutely stitch together something with a Zappi or, or a Workato or Workato, however I pronounce that one. And through the APIs that I've discussed in previous books, that's not stopping anytime soon. In fact, um, as I describe in chapter one, there's this dearth of IT talent. And as more companies try to get people into the office, um, I came across a study from some professors a few months ago at the University of Chicago, a full 100% of IT folks can do their jobs remotely. So that trend is going to kind of butt heads with people's desire to kind of reframe their lives, as I discussed in my previous book. So long story short, um, we've always had a shortage of IT folks. COVID created or intensified the need for business applications before we work remotely or in a hybrid fashion. We didn't necessarily need an app to track who's in the office today. Do we have enough desks as companies reduce the real estate footprint? And yeah, you can let the head of marketing hire a third party independent software vendor to build an app. But as I wrote in my first book a million years ago, new systems and applications typically don't do so well. So something has to give, and fortunately, the no-code, low-code tools, uh, such as Creatio, have absolutely exploded. So uh, in the new book, I attempt to create a vendor-agnostic piece that explains where we are, how we got here, and where we're going. And like you, I think the future of low-code, no-code is pretty damn bright. And I I find it interesting, and I want to call out a couple of things. In in Chapter 5 of your book, you talk about how the the mix of developers is changing. And and you actually cited, I'm going to pull up the graphic here in just a second, you actually cited a Gartner report that said even as soon as maybe 2023, nearly 80% of applications are going to be developed using no-code creators or citizen developers. What were some of your thoughts when you came across this Gartner report? Well, I cite Gartner, Forrester, PwC, KPMG, McKinsey. Um, Microsoft has its own Future of Work Institute, uh, Slack's Future Forum, which is underneath Salesforce. So it wasn't just one report. But yeah, that one I thought was particularly interesting. And in fact, if anything, Jason, it may be understating matters. Um, Microsoft did some research. And according to them, of the next 450 million business apps, 400 million, so 88.88% would be of this no-code, low-code variety. So I made sure that I didn't lean too much on one vendor because one vendor or research outfit or think tank could be wrong. But all the signals were pointing to the fact that this was exploding. Uh, Gartner predicts that I think this year, the total low-code, no-code market will be about $15 billion. And even though that doesn't compare to ERP or security or cloud computing, I think it was Einstein who said that uh, the most powerful uh, law in the universe is exponential growth. So if things are growing that fast, pretty soon it will be 50 or 80 or $100 billion. So there's no doubt in my mind that as the tools become more powerful and companies attempt to roll out new technologies, yeah, I mean, the low-code, no-code tools really do solve, in many cases, a long-standing business problem, as you know, this IT business divide. Right? I mean, if I had a nickel for every time I worked on a project, in which case the IT people thought X and the business folks thought Y, Um, I'd be buying both of us uh, a nice lunch. Um, So the fact that you can have these citizen developers who know marketing, payroll, finance, sales, operations, whatever, 
a lot better than folks and don't have the time or the desire to write out these detailed requirements that are going to take three to six months to get deployed when you can basically build an app, as I write in the book, in a few hours or a few days, depending on the complexity and if you know what you're doing. I just I failed to see how, even though we can talk about some of the downsides of low-code, no-code development, I failed to see how the general trend is not incredibly uh, up into the right hockey stick, like if you will. Yeah, and, and that brings up a couple of interesting topics. So, in in the No Code Playbook that was authored by Catherine and, and Burley, they talk about how to assess some of that complexity and how to build fusion teams. So that mix of IT professional developers as well as citizen developers to help achieve, call it the the, the best outcome possible. And I, I think you also called it out in Chapter Five of your book, which was the the virtuous life cycle or, or the continuing cycle of, of no code development when it comes to why folks are choosing it. And I'll throw in the next graphic up here a little bit. And can you talk to us a little bit about when you see this, this virtual life cycle of just constant improvement and constant um, gains that are done through the use of low code, no code, what were some of the things you were thinking about when you were putting this together? Man, I've spent a long time, Jason, as a consultant, uh, helping companies implement and build different systems in different capacities, vendor assessment um, or evaluation, that type of thing. And I've seen many a skeptical CIO who was maybe pushing 60 and retirement was five years away and basically ain't broke, don't fix it. I, I don't want to risk my retirement or my stock options or security bonus, whatever. Um, so to the extent that there is citizen development taking place in some cases because of shadow IT, whether people know it or not, um, they might say, well, I'm not really keen on that type of thing, really, because we've been doing it for two months and it's been really successful. So you may see this sort of ground up uh, movement towards it as opposed to uh, sort of top down. So it, it's happening whether people realize it or not. I think that as I did the research, I discovered that more CIOs were saying, OK, look, if you're not going to call us and you're going to work with these approved vendors and you're going to support it and train people and not open support tickets because we don't have the bandwidth to address the apps that we currently have, then, hey, go with God. Uh, again, it was just another data point that, yeah, there are going to be organizations, and I cover this in, I think it's chapter eight, that adopt different philosophies. So my friend Lowell uh, Vandekamp works at an ed tech startup here in Arizona where I live, and we had a discussion over lunch when I was formulating the book about how it's a, exclusively a Microsoft shop. Right. They don't want to deal with any vendors. And they know that if Microsoft is late on a particular feature, a particular app, like, for example, it's some um, app loop, which is its kind of knockoff or Almanac or Notion or some of these other Google Docs on steroids type tools. They're fine with that. But another organization might say, no, we'll, we'll adopt or bless or sanction three to four tools. And some companies, it's basically do whatever you want. It's anarchy. It's laissez-faire. In other companies, it's no, you can't use anything. We're going to lock it down for whatever reason. So, you know, the idea that there was one approach to no code, low code, I think is, is very much in keeping. And, and it's interesting knowing a decent amount about your playbook. I, I do think that um, we agree 90% of the time, but it was such a vast area and moving so quickly that there's no way for a book to cover everything. So while I don't advance a proper maturity model or breaking down teams or detailing how you should have two citizen developers for every one proper developer, um, other books, I'm sure, because we're just getting started, as you know, will address those types of things. And I can't wait to read them. Yeah. And, and it's kind of interesting. You bring up a couple of points, right? The the one the one idea that some folks say that one no-code, low-code platform or one vendor should be used for everything. Um, I was talking recently with Phil Laskin, another no-code evangelist um, out there. And, and his take is a little bit that there is no single right tool for everything. And I think that that is also possible, you know, partially true. I think that there's two major factors and, and get your points on this one. Number one is that regardless of whether you adopt the single application suite approach or in your in your book you talk about it as an application set or, or a suite whether you take that approach or you take a more broad approach as phil talks about phil asking excuse me um i think there's important things that people need to think about and they're always worried about one governance and structure and two is making sure that whatever technology you're you're approaching it has a certain set of tools that can enable the users to achieve outcomes do you agree with that what, what are your thoughts yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. So I'll address the first point first. Um, I intentionally avoided governance in any kind of depth because there is this inherent tension. Right? If I'm saying we have to govern it, right? There needs to be some centralized body that's overlooking things, and that 
fundamentally conflicts with this notion of democratized app development. And one of the major benefits, as you know, of citizen development is that you can let people kind of do what they do without going through all the channels and PMOs and all that. They can just do what they want to do. Uh, with respect to the tools, I tried really hard to present this in a vendor agnostic way. In fact, the hardest chapter that I wrote was was for this overview of the landscape. And there's this long disclaimer about how I break things into seven buckets, but it's so tough to do because you know any given tool isn't like, well, Excel you'd really use for manipulating certain types of data. But if it gets to a certain point, you need access. If it gets to a bigger point, you need SQL Server. Uh, but if it's a Word doc, what are you doing in PowerPoint? Right? You wouldn't really write a book in PowerPoint, although some people actually do to organize their thoughts. So it's for some folks to get around this notion, no pun intended, of an app that just does a single into, um, a single thing because they evolve. Um, if, in fact, it's funny because I just wrote a post on my site based on um, Notion um, in late November announced that it had added generative AI capabilities. So you can do slash blog post low code tools and it'll effectively use its engine to spit out a passable blog post or a to-do list or something like that. Um, where do you put that in the contemporary framework? So I call that post something like uh, the amoeba effect. So these tools evolve over time. And I understand why a company might say, look, we're good with these particular tools. We don't have to chase the shiny new thing because we have it on good authority that Google or SAP or Oracle or Salesforce is working on this stuff. And ultimately, Jason, I'd argue that the citizen developer benefits because you're really forcing the competition to up their game. This isn't 1994, and it was basically Windows, or if you want to want a Mac, you can, but you probably can't use 90% of the apps that you need. So it is confusing. There is a lot of choice, and hopefully chapter four of the book is useful in providing this gestalt um, but I have no doubt that there's probably a CMO right now reading my book going, that is absolutely not true. You can't call it this because we're that. Yeah, no, and, and I, I will I will admittedly say I actually had that exact same initial reaction as I was reading through that going, no, no, that's not that's not the way it is. And then after I got a little further, I was like, OK, well, I see that perspective. So um, it's very interesting because, you know, we talk about your book, Low Code, No Code. And I talk about the no code playbook all the time. And I, I even talking with other other no code evangelists that are out there, right? Guys like Phil Laskin. It's 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 very clear that we all see the evolution very similarly, which is we're still somewhere probably on that upslope and nowhere near product maturity. That's why, like you mentioned, yeah, like you mentioned, there's there's a wide variety of different technologies that are out there, but we're all continuing to adopt new technology or new features or new capabilities. Some are pinpoint solutions that are solving maybe an RPA type of a type of item, right? A UI path or something like that. Or there's BPM solutions out there, which has become a little less of a, of a priority, especially with the pandemic, right? Folks are more focused on how can I get things out faster? They're still focused on automation, but how can I get things out faster? How can I accelerate that application development lifecycle? And you talk about that, and there's a great graphic in the book that I didn't bring up today. But we all kind of see this the same way, which is this no-code, low-code space is going to continue to evolve, and we're going to continue to um, bring new players into the into this world, whether it's part of the Fusion team, part of the back-end enabling business. I actually think that there may be more of a shift left. We may get these citizen developers and no-code creators even further back into the development life cycle of these no-code tools to help enable the business pieces even faster. And just with about two minutes left before we wrap, can you give me some of your thoughts? And, and uh, there's a great quote, and you've got it all over the cover of your book, that the future of coding is no coding at all. And, and that's from the former CEO of GitHub. Give me your thoughts on how this world of no-code and low-code is going to continue to evolve over the next couple of years. I love that quote so much so that not only does it adorn the front page of my website, but on the hardcover edition of the book, I just put it in 60 point font. Um, you've got the paper back there, but I went even bigger than that one. And just, it takes up pretty much the entire back. I just, it was kind of meme -y. but no, I, as I said before, I think the future is incredibly bright. We're going to see consolidation. I intentionally didn't put in one of those sort of I chart figures about the universe and the vendors in each one because it would have been outdated long before we went to print. You're going to see companies, especially if, if someone got valued at a certain number and now they're facing a down round, they'll be able to acquire um, either the code or the user base or the um, 
whatever the data on the cheap. So you know, it's silly for me to think that there will be you know, hundreds or thousands of these vendors around. And that's just the nature of technology. I mean, right now, there are probably three to four different uh, cloud service providers that have come, um, take care of 80% of the market. Um, I don't know if we'll ever see that uh, level of um, concentration. But one of the points I make in the book is that if you're evaluating a tool, you want to make sure that, you know, again, no one can predict the future. But if you go to the Facebook page or the YouTube channel and you see basically no one's on it, is that to- tool going to be around in a while? And there is vendor lock-in irrespective of which tool you're doing. In fact, I make the point in the book that if you're evaluating a new tool, one of the first things you ought to do before you get too deep in is to export the data out. Yeah, you're going to have to rebuild the app. There's no magic convert app button from quote unquote platform A to platform B. But I think it's a bright one. And I think that is a, it's a wide tent. So there's plenty of room for a lot of books. And if you're starting a company, I wouldn't think you would just read one book on entrepreneurship. You probably want to read a bunch. So I don't look at other books as, as competition. In fact, I'm really curious to see other people's takes because it's fine that you disagree in part with chapter four. But I think that a rational discussion about an interesting topic is a good thing to have and, and reasonable people can disagree. It's like I said, when I first read it, it was like, oh, no, no, no. And then I started to I started to go further and deeper into that chapter. And it was like, OK, yeah, I get that. And, and the point that I think that a lot of the no code evangelists like myself and, and yourself and Phil Laskin are talking about is the fact that it's still evolving. It's still emerging and companies are still working on adding more features, trying to get as close as they can to some of the business function so that they can be successful and, and really help enable some of these these companies and in the various business applications that they're trying to do. So with that, Phil, I thank you for your time today. I look forward to having you on our podcast in the very near future again. And then for those of you who have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. I also do highly recommend, and I posted a review on this book on Amazon. Go check it out. Both of our, both the books, Phil's No Code, Low Code, as well as the No Code Playbook are available on Amazon. I encourage you, go check them out, download a copy, get yours today. Phil, thank you again for joining us. Jason, I enjoyed it. Have a good day. Thank you. For those of you who are watching us, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more. And for those of you who are listening to us today, I hope you had a great time. Check out our previous episodes on various platforms. The No Code Playbook podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and many more. To get more information about our products or services, visit our website at www.creatio.com. And for more insights, check out our No Code Events page. Hope to see you soon.